Hi, this is Barney Oram, and you are listening to the Sound Architect podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Architect podcast. I am your host, Sam Hughes. And as you just heard, today I'm joined by sound designer Barney Oram. Thanks for joining me today, Barney. How are you? I'm good, thank you, Sam. How are you? I'm very well, and I'm very happy to finally have you on the show. I've been meaning to have you on for a very long time, so it's great to finally have you. So I've got you on the show to talk a bit about your recent sound library, Western Black Powder Guns, which sounds awesome, by the way. Thank you. But before that, I'd love to know, you know, for the benefit of our listeners, why don't you tell a bit about yourself and your journey into game audio? Uh, yeah, it's probably fairly similar to, to a lot of people. I um, kind of got into making music and um, electronic music when I was a teenager, and I went to study uh, kind of audio engineering when I was at university. And at university, I discovered sound design uh, as a concept and somehow got onto the idea that I could marry sound design with uh, video games and that just made uh, the world of sense to me really and um, and yeah I, I, I kind of just pursued that and managed to get a job um, back in 2016 with a company called Cloud Imperium Games um, who hired me as a junior uh, and about a year and a half ago, I started working for a company called Sweet Justice Sound, um, who I now work for full time. Fantastic. So where did you first get the idea to do this library? Yeah, well, um, a lot of libraries really um, kind of come about from, in my opinion, from like seeing what isn't really available much on the market and uh, trying to fill that need. And also it's a question of like, what do I have access to or what could I possibly get access to if I looked for it? And so, yeah, I, I just thought um, a library that was very much kind of dedicated towards this kind of Western sensibility in terms of guns would be quite a fun one to make. Um, and also having had a, a look around, uh, I managed to find a place um, just a few hours from me that had a selection of really nice kind of 19th century style um, black powder kind of flintlock guns, which was awesome. Nice. Yeah, that's super cool. And what place was this? What were they called? Uh, it was a place called Yeevely uh, Shooting Estate. Um, and it's kind of near, well, it's Derbyshire area. Um, and yeah, it was this really quite lovely little uh, shooting range attached to a, um, like a stately home. And um, it was run by a, an old chap who was very, very friendly. <laughs> and I don't think he quite understood what we were doing, but um, but they were willing. So <laughs> that's the amazing part of our job, isn't it? A lot of time people just give you that weird look of, all right, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Turn up with all your gear. Yes. Yeah. So um, I went down and they, they prepped all of these guns and um, we set them up in this this kind of lovely range. It was quite a wet and muddy day, I have to say, but, um, <laughs> but uh, the recording sounded good. Yeah, and they do. So in terms of that then, how did you know what equipment to take? How did you prep for the shoot? There must have been a lot of planning before you went down there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I hadn't recorded a ton of actual guns before, but I had recorded a few louder things so it was mostly a question of figuring out the kind of microphones that i wanted to use that would capture things um in an interesting way and a way that you know didn't um use the the characteristic the microphone to its the best of its ability um and also just variation and also the other thing that i really wanted to focus on was capturing um stereo takes because a lot of libraries or uh, not so much these days but traditionally quite a few libraries particularly gun libraries um tend to focus on mono takes and yeah. um uh, they are useful for sure but i i always find myself reaching to stereo takes when i'm actually making gun sounds myself so i decided to focus on that um in the recording you can make a stereo sound mono but you can't really make a mono sound stereo or not very easily at least so um the the beauty of mono recordings is they have uh they usually capture the transient um a lot better and they usually capture yeah. the, the low end of the sound better as well because in my opinion uh bass sounds better in mono um or in a narrow kind of stereo field so um in that sense it's better but 
I think for stereo, for me, um, just having that flexibility to make stuff sound wide and sound big uh, was the kind of idea behind that approach. Yeah, so you had your equipment ready, basically. So you had your mics. What about the recorders and your list of what you were going to shoot and how? Did you go there beforehand and be like, right, okay, this is where we're going to record? And, you know, or did you just go there blind with everything and then assess the situation on site? Yeah, I, I kind of, I did prep the mics. Um, so I had uh, the mic list and I have a few different recorders that I used, um, a Mix Pre 6 by Sound Devices and a Zoom f6 as well um and yeah in terms of like actually what we were going to do on the day uh i kind of was going was going in a, a little bit blind because they, <laughs> they their emails were quite brief um so <laughs> so i just thought yeah I'll, I'll turn up and see what they're willing to do and amazingly they were willing to fire quite a lot of guns um which was awesome yeah fantastic and Obviously, the temptation is there to, when you have that amount of mics and everything, to record everything from every angle all at once. But that's not necessarily the best way to go about it, is it? How did you decide where your mic placement was going to be, what mics you were going to use on each one? Because there's already going to be a million recordings you have to go through at the end of the day anyway. So <laughs> how did you decide to kind of be a bit more precise? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I tended to do, or generally I will do, is group um, a kind of close perspective, a medium perspective, and a far perspective as best I can. And usually, like choosing the mics based on their characteristics to f to fit those needs. So obviously, yeah. things that are closer will need um, a kind of uh, something that's going to handle a, a louder SPL better. Um, the, the the distance is really for, is just a kind of question of giving people the variety when they're actually using the the library instead of everything yeah. being recorded you know 10 feet away it's there's a variety of like okay if i wanted to have a slightly different transient response it's going to sound different at distance so it, it gives the, the sound editors and the sound designers using the library uh, that option yeah and obviously with firearms it's it's there's a lot to consider in terms of safety not just for yourself but obviously our beloved equipment <laughs> yes <laughs> how did you uh how close can you get before you're like yeah i don't really want to put the microphone any closer now <laughs> to be honest <laughs> um well i mean the closest microphone that you can put on something really or the, that i have at least is um these ones called the dpa 4062s which are these little lavalier microphones that have um a really 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 high spl response so you can literally clip it onto the gun or oh, onto wow. the shooter yeah and it um it usually sounds pretty good it doesn't actually um do that much damage <laughs> um <laughs> oh, it's good but um yes but there's some microphones in fact in this library uh i kind of misjudged one of them the oh no um <laughs> yeah the sheps uh, mini cmit which is actually unfortunately quite an expensive mic to uh to have misjudged i was gonna say out of all of the ones to misjudge. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i put that i think either five meters or ten meters away which is um quite considerably close and it um what happened is it when you uh fire a gun or any loud sound really you get a little bit of a shock wave uh, like a yeah. physical shock wave along with the actual sound um and what that does is it kind of buffets the uh diaphragm of the microphone um and so you get a little bit of clipping a bit of distortion that you can't yeah. really remove uh, even in a kind of 32-bit world where everything doesn't clip anymore um <laughs> you found <laughs> you a way get that <laughs> yes <laughs> yes Amazing. And obviously the recording side, I mean, I guess it depends on your preference, but the recording side can actually be considered the quote unquote easy part, right? You've got everything afterwards that you have to do in yes. terms of making a sound library. Now, I've personally not made a sound library myself and I've used many, um, but there's a lot more involved than I think even I consider in the post-processing because people think, oh yeah, you just go around, you know, you chop up your recordings, bish, bash, bosh, done. But it's not necessarily the case, is it? No, not not at all, actually. Um, I completely misjudged that as well. I thought, <laughs> oh, you know, the recording's the hard part and then I'll just chop them, trick them in Reaper and then off you go. But actually the the 
process of editing it and cleaning the sounds in RX yeah. and packaging them and doing the metadata and all that stuff takes ages. <laughs> yeah, I can <laughs> it takes imagine. a really long time. It becomes admin yeah. at one point, surely. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> now, in terms of the RX cleanup, again, there must be, I mean, I'm only talking about hypothetically if I was doing this, that there must be that sense of, I don't want to over-process it afterwards because obviously I want to give people the raw, the rawest recording I can to let them do what they want to do with it. But at the same time, you want to give people a high quality source to use. So how do you toe the line of, okay, I want to clean this up, but I don't want to make it sound too processed. And how do I get this to a, a nice clean version? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, it's just a question of like, um, I want it to sound as useful as possible uh, straight away. For me, like when I find sounds in libraries and it sounds like they'll need a lot of work to get the sound into a kind of useful state, a lot of, you know, I have to go in and manually denoise stuff, de-click stuff, take out people yeah. talking and stuff like that. Um, that straight away turns me off when I'm, you know, working as a sound designer myself. So um, I, I, I try not to go too hard so that... Um, you get any artifacts or anything like that from the denoising, but um, yeah, of course. But yeah, just making it instantly useful is the idea, really. Yeah, and then obviously you've provided some actually designed sounds as part of the library yes. as well. Uh, same sort of question here, but how do you decide what to do with the source material to then go? Okay, now here's a selection of processed versions to give you an idea of is it an idea of what you can do with it, or also provide source that people can use straight off the bat again yeah well it's funny actually the design section is kind of what prompted me to finish the library um uh, <laughs> i i watched um django unchained uh one day um the kind of great inspiration for this library i'm yes. sure <laughs> the kind of <laughs> strange western spoof film by uh tarantino which is a great film by the way um and um it's fantastic yeah. yeah and i just loved the gun sounds in that i thought they sounded awesome and um, while I was watching it, I was thinking, oh, I recorded a bunch of black powder guns uh, a while ago, didn't I? <laughs> so I just was <laughs> sitting on un it. Oh, yeah, I did that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I grabbed them and I had actually already cleaned them um, as a colleague of mine and had asked for them to use for a project. And um, so they were kind of ready to go. And I just spent a few days just making some kind of Django inspired Western gun sounds, um, just processing them and pushing them to the kind of furthest they'd go to sound cool. Um, yeah. And yeah, and, and then I finished the design section and I thought, I could just make a whole little library out of this. So I did. And um, there we go. <laughs> ah, so it actually almost worked backwards from the design side. And you're like, oh, actually, these are usable. Yes. These are pretty good. Yeah. I, I, should, I should probably give them to other people as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nice. And one of my favorite um, parts of the library, I have to admit, is how you've managed to capture the mechanism sounds of the weapons as well. Is that from the DPA mic on the shooter that mainly caught that? Uh, that was actually from... Um, we kind of we recorded the um mech stuff separately um before we did the right. kind of main shoot uh just in a um shooting lodge that they had nearby um and to be honest not that much of the stuff we recorded was super useful but there were one or two takes that i thought um really kind of captured that you know that sound that is is nice and i used it a fair bit on the design section and i thought well, okay i'll include it as well because if i find it useful other people might find it useful as well so yeah yeah definitely now one of the things i'm most curious about is what you've learned because this isn't your first library this is your third i believe yes that's right yeah yeah so you've made three sound libraries now this was probably the most ambitious out of the three how have you grown as a recordist and designer and learn along the way making these libraries and also what cautionary tales would you tell to anyone who wants to go out and record a library even like specifically guns um yeah i think um 
for one of the big mistakes that I made on the, the lo-fi sci-fi library, which was my second one, was um, I kind of got a little bit too ingrained in this uh, lo-fi um, aesthetic approach and um, all of the sounds in that library are mono. <laughs> <laughs> well, they really, they really shouldn't be. But uh, I was kind of, which we know now is your least favourite. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, probably because of that, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, uh, I was really obsessed with stuff like Alien, and I was like, okay, I'm going to try and make this sound as as uh, as old as I possibly can. And so that decision uh, was one I made early on, making that library, and then halfway through, realised, oh, make everything mono is a bit boring, really. Um, so <laughs> I kind of regret that as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that I've learned is, um, I always try to record at the highest sample rate I can now, uh, even if I don't include it at the highest sample rate, um, at least I have that as an option. You know, you can't go back and, and recapture something like guns when you've, when you've, uh, recorded something at the wrong sample rate. Um, yeah. And and yeah, I mean, I, the other thing I always try to put focus on is a, a nice design section because uh, I think that having that almost just as an inspiration sometimes is really cool in a library. You can kind of say, well, this is what they've made with the, the sounds, that the source sounds that are included. What could I make with it? And also, I think that, you know, it's very easy to use design sounds in your work as well. You know, hopefully that's something that is um a time saver for people and things like that so yeah yeah definitely and do you have any other plans for more libraries now that you've done this one or has it kind of broken you where you're like okay yeah that was enough i've, <laughs> I've dipped into sound libraries now i've had my fun um yeah actually over the last year or so i have been recording um quite a large uh explosives library um oh wow yes and that again as you have you said that has taken me considerably longer to edit than i had anticipated i thought it'd be it took me about a year to record the, the library and i thought it'd be a few months of editing but no it's taken ages <laughs> it's taken a really yeah. long time and is that sheer to, is that due to the sheer amount of content or is that down to the selection process because i can imagine especially um same with the guns uh, but with explosions you're looking for those unique personalities right you're looking for the ones that set them apart and isn't just the same as the same explosion before it and how do you i mean i suppose you just listen to everything over and over and be like okay a b this a b that is this better than that one and do you just kind of condense and eliminate as you go through yeah absolutely um one of the recording sessions I actually did for the Explosion Library was at this uh, kind of military show in the UK um, where they had uh, like actual live firing tanks, believe it or not. Um, and they, these tanks are firing, oh, wow. yeah, <laughs> firing rounds into this, uh, I can't remember where it was, I think it was near Rugby, uh, into this field uh, and I was out there recording it. Um, and annoyingly, they, they had kind of a, a bit of a crowd and like a presenter uh, oh. who was talking over stuff other people um, oh, yeah, it's the yeah. worst it's just so annoying <laughs> you just want to be there um, on your own with your recorder yeah yeah so um amazing opportunity to re record these big tanks firing but um you know one out of three takes has a child screaming or some bloke saying yeah ladies and gentlemen big hand and all this kind of thing <laughs> so, yeah yeah and you can't really go like excuse me um e3 next weekend could you just bring the tanks back <laughs> yes. um just for me yeah uh, <laughs> be great yeah so what kind of um what kind of explosives should we look forward to well the the library is really varied actually I, I recorded um a few different cannons for it which was really fun i recorded uh a mortar and i recorded oh, wow. yeah and one of the big sessions that i did for it was um i managed to get in contact with this uh film uh kind of pyrotechnics explosives company um who were based at this um ex-military like storage facility and um 
they like brought out the big guns and they they had like TNT and C4 and things like this crazy oh my god really highly explosive substances yeah <laughs> and we went out to the field at the back of this That's um, both scary and exciting <laughs> yeah it was well the funny thing about plastic explosives is they're not uh, <laughs> they're not reactive in their in their natural state you have, you have to excite no, of course, it you with need the detonator um, yeah, yeah with the detonator so um we went down to this uh, they had this kind of um workshop where had, they had all these explosives laid out on a table and um <laughs> and one of the the armorers who was handling the explosives just threw uh, a little block of semtex at me and of course i uh yeah you panicked <laughs> i was I quite would scared too, even knowing this um, thing <laughs> but yeah you um, it's just like plasticine you can hold it in your hand and it uh it's fine but you stick yeah. a bit of uh deck cord in it and it goes bang which is awesome <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's insane how, how it works. And did you imagine that, you know, at some point in your life, you sat here going, so the funny thing about plastic explosives, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, I think um, I, I started uh, last year with this idea. Um, I recorded a few fireworks um, and I thought this would be an interesting challenge to try and make a, a library of explosion sounds. Um probably mostly out of naivety and um <laughs> so and so i contacted everyone i, I could mean you did and, pick one of the hardest libraries to make yes, straight away absolutely like, yes so. yeah um <laughs> contacted a bunch of people and and tried to see what was possible to do and actually it turns out uh it is possible despite um despite what i thought so yeah uh, i guess it was a bit ambitious but um it was it was fun <laughs> it was worth doing I can imagine. And obviously, as you say, there's a lot of editing to be done on the Explosion Library, but when could we maybe look forward to that? I'm really hoping to get it done in the next month or so, hopefully. Um, that's the plan. I, I'm yet to... Uh, I Usually what I do is I edit all the recordings and get them cleaned and stuff and then make the design sounds. And so that process sh hopefully shouldn't take too long, but I'd quite like to make quite a cool design section uh, with those sounds. So, yeah. And how do you decide how many? Would you say roughly there's like a percentage of the library that you're like, okay, I'll do like 10% of sound designed uh, files or like 20% of designed files? Yeah, I do try to stick to a kind of rough uh, approach like that in terms of like a, a fraction of the overall uh, sound count. But what I more try to do is um, just make sounds, as many sounds as um, as I can that feels organic you know so uh, at the point where I feel like I've um, done all I can in terms of design because um, there's only so far really that you can push the material that you have before it starts to sound samey um, so yeah I, I generally find that it usually ends up being um, fairly obvious when I've you know run out of ideas <laughs> yeah they start sounding too similar and you're like okay I think we're done now yes yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah now, one of my kind of towards the end questions, one of my final questions on this library would be, how do you decide how much to sell a library for? How do you put a, a, a price on what you've put into this library and also expect that this is going to be paid based on what you've done? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, that, actually, because uh, there's a lot of factors really that decide how much you should sell a library for. I think... Um, for me, a big factor is uh, obviously, as you say, I've only made a few libraries. And I'm still a bit of a rookie, really, in the sound world. So I think. But should um, that matter, you know? Should it matter what experience you have if it's a good library? Yeah, well, I mean, I kind of try to price stuff in a way that I think if people, you know, haven't heard of me before or um, aren't sure what I'm capable of, they'll st it's still at a level where they're, they're happy to pay that kind of price um yeah you know just based on the content even if um you know that they, they have no prior knowledge of who i am or what i do so um there's certainly that and also the actual size of the library and how much effort has gone into it and how much money went into the initial side of it as well um, of course yeah and it's quite bespoke it's quite niche yes so i guess that must play a part in it as well like not everyone can just go out and record guns and especially Western black powder guns. Yeah, totally. And and as well from a kind of sales perspective, I I really try to get quite niche um, in terms of 
the library itself in terms of like filling a specific need um yeah exactly I, I think like you know if someone's working on a western film or game or whatever hopefully they'll they'll have a look around and see what libraries are available and say oh here's one that someone's made um and as i said not many of those um in that style are around so yeah hopefully in that sense it'll it'll be useful yeah i hope so okay just to wrap up on this whole kind of library topic what would you advise to anyone else wanting to go out and make their library what else would you say to them yeah i think um uh, i really enjoy the process of making libraries i think i get so much kind of reward from recording the sounds myself and then using those sounds and designs and then being able to share that with other people i find that really fun and i think that uh it can seem a bit bewildering um it certainly did to me at the start the idea of putting a library together and there's this kind of um black magic of of um metadata that like <laughs> seems to be an unspoken thing um, <laughs> but you know there's there's tons of resources out there and i would say the vast majority of people that make libraries um would be willing to help you you know or explain to you how they've done a certain thing or put something together so um yeah the in my opinion the beautiful thing about libraries is uh you don't have to make something that's you know uh fits into whatever project you're working on um like i have never worked on a western style project and um for me the opportunity to make a library of of that style was was attractive because it's not something that i've explored before so um yeah yeah and it, it also there's a, a quite a a good community online of people uh, making libraries and people that are kind of i think pushing each other to to make better stuff and to make uh things that are uh, more unusual and more useful and um being part of that is really really cool so yeah i would definitely I'd definitely say to anyone that's that's interested in making one go for it you know try it out obviously you'll make mistakes but along the way you'll probably uh record some cool sounds and and you know that could be useful to somebody out there so do it yeah and some of those mistakes could actually turn into great sound design as we all know absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> amazing well i have to say it's been an absolute pleasure barney sadly that is the end of my questions um but i would love to have you back on the show in the near future absolutely that'd be great thank you very much for having me it's been a pleasure take care bye Hey everyone, this is Sam. Thanks very much for listening to the Sound Architect podcast today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If so, there are many ways you can support the show, which is incredibly appreciated. Obviously, there's the financial way where you can support us on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash sounddesignuk. However, there are many other ways which also help, such as liking, subscribing, reviewing, commenting, and sharing via whatever channel you listen on. Thanks so much for your support already. It really is a work of passion for me, and I'd love to keep sharing the knowledge from all these talented and wonderful people. Thanks again, and catch you on the next episode. I'm Dallas Taylor, host of 20,000 Hertz, a podcast that reveals the untold stories behind the sounds of our world. We've uncovered the incredible intelligence of talking parrots. Basically, bird brain was a pejorative term and here I had this bird that was doing the same types of tasks as the primates. We've investigated the bonding power of music. There's an intimacy there in communicating through the medium of music that can be really a powerful force for bringing people together. We've explored the subtle nuances of the human voice. We have to remember that humans, over many hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, have become extremely attuned to the sounds of each other's voices. And we've revealed why a famous composer wrote a piece made entirely of silence. I think that's a really potentially quite useful and quite profound experience to have. Subscribe to 20,000 Hertz right here in your podcast player. I'll meet you there. Hi all, this is Becky and Susan from the Sound Girls Podcast, where we speak to audio professionals from all walks of life. Join us Tuesdays at 9 a.m. and listen to the amazing array of sound humans talk about how they got into the biz. And a few cool things, like roadie nicknames and fizzy water preferences. You can find the Sound Girls Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as our website, soundgirls.org.
On Tonebender Sound Design Podcast, we talk to the Mandalorian's mixer, Bonnie Wilde. If we get this wrong, people are going to be mad at us. <laughs> and the more we talk to people working in sound, the more we find out that they are just trying to figure out what works. Like Dave Whitehead, who had no idea how to make the spaceship sounds for District 9. Until he tried. A vibrator shoved into a dobro guitar. And hopefully after a while, you gain enough experience. Like 15-time Oscar nominee, Randy Tom. The most interesting stuff almost always happens when you're in the process of doing it. And you hope you get it perfect, like Steve Bodecker did on Black Panther. You can create in people's imagination something far more terrifying than they could ever see. On Tone Vendors, we talk with the incredible artists doing sound for your favorite films, TV shows, and games. They tell us how they finally figured it out. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts or visit ToneBendersPodcast.com. We didn't even get to take phone calls on, like, yeah. Joe Dorowski films, line two. <laughs>